to myself again But it's the only way you're ever gonna learn You look back and it's all in the past I'm dwelling on the thoughts I cannot see Hi, welcome along to NUFC Matters with me, Steve Wraith. And as always, I like to do a different interview every now and again. And I'm delighted to say, following off the back of Nigel Ely's interview a couple of weeks ago, which I think a lot of you enjoyed, uh, I have brought on Philip Neem. Uh, and Philip is the author of Penal Company on the Falklands. Fantastic book, great read. Um, most of you know that I've got okay. a big interest in uh, different military campaigns, and uh, this one was was no different. Uh, you know, it was a, a fantastic read, great book. You'll be able to get the link down below. Uh, so please go and order a copy. But Philip, welcome to the show. Thank you very much, Steve. Great to have you on, and uh, looking forward to talking a little bit about uh, your life and. Uh, just, just tell us, you know, a little bit about where you were brought up, where you were born, where you were brought up. Uh, well, I was born in um, Guernsey. Uh, I lived there until I was seven. My, uh, my uh, dad was uh, uh, stationed out there after the war, uh, and um, uh, then came back to this country. Uh, brought up in Kent, uh, largely. Uh, well, uh, from the age of seven onwards until I went off to university. Um, and then um, uh, after university, well, I, I, I re was reading law at university, but uh, that, I, instead I took up uh, uh, rock climbing and that sort of took over my life. So um, I didn't complete the law degree uh, and left and thought, well, I better start looking for a job. And I joined initially the um, RAF and joined the RAF regiment. Uh, and ended up uh, for three years in their parachute squadron. Um, and then I think I just took the view that the RF Regiment, certainly in those days, was a, a, a bit limiting. Uh, and I was offered a permanent commission, was posted to RAF Uxbridge. And I thought this isn't what I joined for. Um, and an old friend of mine who was uh, ex-parachute regiment said, I don't know what you're pissing around for, Phil. You know, why don't you leave and join the parachute regiment? Uh, oh, what a good idea. Uh, so uh, belatedly, I arrived uh, after six years in the RAF regiment, uh, in the parachute regiment, initially joined uh, three para, who were based in Aldershot at the time, but then were uh, posted to uh, uh, Germany. Uh, again, I, I kind of took the view that the parachute regiment didn't really belong in Germany, and if they didn't, neither did I. So I applied for uh, special duties. Um, and served 18 months on special duties. Um, and then after another two years, I ended up uh, posted to two para in um, late 1981. So that by then sort of leading into uh, a few months before the Falklands War. Mm. What was the RAF like then? I mean, draw a comparison between the RAF and the paras. What, what makes them so different from, from your perspective? Well, I think the difference between their, their parachute squadron uh, and uh, and the parachute regiment uh, is uh, is very slim, really. I think the, the key difference is that, you know, ultimately the RAF regiment uh, is there to defend RAF assets rather than you know get seriously stuck in with the enemy. Uh, so it's always going to have that sort of slightly limited uh, sort of cap on on, on what it's going to get involved in. Um, but I mean, in, interesting question because when I joined the uh, the parachute regiment, the regimental colonel, uh, sort of fairly legendary character named uh, 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 called Joe Starling, said, "Phil, um, I know you've done the RAF regiment's parachute squadron selection, uh, and I know it's just as hard as P Company, the the parachute regiment selection, but no one else does, and uh, so uh, I just think perhaps you ought to." Uh, do P Company. And then he said, and we also ought to really send you to Sandhurst. And uh, I, I guess I must have looked a bit sort of shocked by all this. Uh, and he said, well, look, let's reach a deal. Do one or the other. So I said, I'll do P Company. And that was obviously the right answer because he said, well, look, all you need to do is the, you know, two week selection. So, uh, you know, that was my arrival as it were. But I think it was absolutely right. You know, I had to be seen to go through P Company and uh, not anyone else's sort of look-alike selection uh, for my own credibility I accepted that 
I think a lot of my interest, you know, stemmed, I guess, from watching, you know, various war films as a child. But then, but then moving forward was a documentary that was on Channel Four called P Company, and um, it's something which I kept a hold of on videotape for many years, and then eventually transferred it from videotape into an MP4, and I I stuck it on my YouTube channel. This is long before I became a podcaster. Yeah. And it was one of my most viewed videos. I think it hit something like 1.4 million uh, views on on YouTube, and, uh, and and it showed that it wasn't just me who was an interest in it. But tell us tell us about those P Company days. I mean, the training for me, just as an observer, watching a one hour documentary, which of course doesn't do the whole course justice, but it looked grueling, uh, and you had to be of a certain ilk a certain strength mentally and physically to do that for them what was it like for you personally to do p company um well uh, i suppose i uh, you know i had done my sort of as it were dress rehearsal with the uh, rf regiment's parachute squadron so i knew what was coming in a sense uh and i'd also uh, just uh come back from actually doing a, a, a first descent of a mountain in the himalayas uh so i was I think seriously fit. <laughs> and so uh, I, you know, breezed into it um, thinking, you know, yeah, this will be a doddle. I have to say uh, it wasn't, I don't think it ever is um, uh, no matter how fit you are or, um, or, or what your background and experience is. going through a course like that is also, uh, you know, it's a mental and physical test. Uh, I think primarily, uh, frankly, uh, in my case, you know, because I was fit, I think it was primarily a mental test. Uh, and I think it's, it's, it's all a question, really, of how much do you really want to join this outfit? Uh, and if you want it hard enough, then the mind kicks in and you get through it. If you've got doubts uh, uh, or whatever, then you start to struggle. Mm, no, there's no no doubt about that. And I'll stick the link for P Company into the description of this interview as well. It's well worth right. well worth a watch indeed. So being stationed, moving moving forward to the you know the parachute regiment, where was your where was your first you know active service? Uh, well, when I was still in the uh, in the uh, RAF regiment, I'd seen um, service done several tours in. Uh, in Northern Ireland, um, and the RF Regiment was also uh, involved in a, a little-known war in Dofar, which is southern Oman, uh, where there is a counterinsurgency going on, uh, and quite a lot of uh, uh, seconded and contract officers working for the Sultan of Oman's uh, armed forces. Uh, so, uh, again, I saw uh active service down there although i have to say defending the the uh, airfield down there rf salala was uh meant again i mean this was the limitation of the rf regiment we weren't directly involved in in you know seeking out and killing the enemy the the counterinsurgents uh which you know i'd say was frustrating in a way and and was also i think part of the reason for thinking you know if i want a fully active career you know, I really did need to, uh, you know, as a, effectively an infantryman, I really did need to uh, join the army and join the parachute regiment. You know, obviously you mentioned at the start of the podcast about your study in law uh, and, and then dipping out. Is that a regret when you look back, Phil? Do you, do you ever regret not doing that? <laughs> um, no, I think, um, uh, you know, I look back and, you know, I've uh, had a very satisfying life uh, a satisfying career uh, and i think of the experiences that uh, uh, i would have missed out on had i persevered with a legal career and i think i'm i'm very glad i've done what i've done falklands war uh, and other things a lot of climbing uh, all over the world which again the the um, uh, the services indulged me in uh, so uh, no, I have no regrets, really. Uh, and the fact is, you know, it was my decision. Um, you know, I was, instead of studying law at, at Southampton University, I was spending four days a week um, climbing on the uh, Swanage Sea Cliffs or going up to North Wales. Uh, and climbing at that stage took over my life. It was much more important than studying law. I've got, uh, you know, I've got no regrets. Uh, my, my climbing has been a huge part of my life. Uh, so I made my choices and, and I lived with them and I, I enjoyed what I did. 
War is something that we all hope in Europe we will never hear of. Obviously, you know, as as we speak, the Ukraine war is uh, is ongoing, and um, you know, we we all you know send our thoughts to the to the good people of of Ukraine at this moment in time. But the Falklands War was was you know something which really just came out of the blue, and it was a ten week undeclared war between Argentina and the UK. Um, Tell us about your mindset when, you know, this started to, you know, to emerge as, as, as a potential conflict that you would have to, to go and attend. Was, was there an excitement mm. about getting involved? Yeah, I mean, uh, no big surprise. The, well, the, the, the battalion was on leave when all this kicked off uh, and no big surprise. I was up in Scotland doing some ice climbing. Uh, you know, why wouldn't I be? Uh, and... Um, uh, I mean, really, yeah, as you say, this this came out of the blue. Uh, my immediate reaction was, I wonder if we're going to be recalled. And um, uh, so nothing happened for a couple of days. Uh, and then eventually uh, I got this telegram up in Scotland uh, with the single word Bruneval. Bruneval was the uh, name of one of our battle colours and, and also um, uh, uh, the name of our barracks, and that was the code word for return to barracks. So I gave a whoop of joy. Uh, my wife, who was with me, wasn't quite so chuffed by that, but, uh, you know, immediately started packing uh, and went back to Aldershot. And I suppose, as much as anything else, you know, we thought, where are the Falklands? You know, I was already up in Scotland. I thought sort of probably some offshore island on the, north the northwest coast of Scotland. Um, uh, and so it did need getting the maps out and a little bit of homework before we realised that they were quite a long way away. Um, and, and uh, you know, very few people have ever really heard or, or shown any interest in the Falklands. So I, I think in the back of my mind, and I'm sure in most people's, was, you know, what on earth are we, you know, what's going on here? What are we going to war uh, for, um, you know, for these islanders, 2000? As my my one of my 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 soldiers put it, two thousand sheep shaggers, you know, the other end of the world. It it, it just it, it all seems surreal. That was the, the the thing. But equally, if there was going to be something going on, then you know we were absolutely busting a gut that we wanted to get involved. War was declared. <laughs> uh, Forty warships ready, as the, the, the Sun newspaper published. Uh, Paras are called up, which of course was yourself, Prince Andrew. Um, ready to yeah. go, and uh, a leader in Margaret Thatcher at the time. You know, looking back now, um, you know the thoughts on Maggie and and what she did at, at that time. Was it the right decision by her to send the boys in? Yeah, I think uh, you know, uh, looking back, uh, there's absolutely no doubt in my mind for all the questions of you know, well, we, what, what on earth are we you know going all this way just for all these you know two thousand islanders. Um, for all that, you know, uh, as we got involved, it, it became completely clear, and I think in all our minds, that uh, uh, this was the right thing to do. Uh, and um, uh, and I think the f closer we got to the islands, the more aware we became of the uh, leadership that Maggie Thatcher was was providing. And whatever your views on on um, uh, Maggie Thatcher. Uh, she provided that leadership. And if you're going to go into uh, this sort of situation, then, you know, you do need leadership and it has to come right from the top. No pussyfooting around. Uh, and we did feel that she was absolutely um, committed to this, that she had our back. Uh, and, you know, my CEO, H. Jones, who was skilled at Goose Green, one of VC, I mean, you know, one of his sort of rallying cries is, you know, what are we doing this for, chaps? Because Maggie says, you know, it was it was important to us. Uh, as I say, whatever whatever your views of of, uh, of Mrs. Thatcher, that uh, you know, when leadership was required, um, and you know, it needed guts on her part as well. I think then uh, she provided it. Yeah, cometh the hour, cometh the woman, uh, yeah, as opposed absolutely. to cometh the, cometh the man. So, yeah, you, you know, you venture out to the Falklands. What was your first impressions of the place? Uh, <laughs> cold, wet, <laughs> pretty <laughs> miserable place. Um, uh, and, I mean, certainly when we uh, uh, first went ashore, I thought, uh, this is just one massive peat bog. Um, and, I mean, our first objective when we went ashore in San Carlos was to secure Sussex Mountain, which, you know, it's a sort of a climb of sort of three or four hundred metres. 
uh, and um, I don't know, I can't remember now, sort of half a dozen kilometers. Uh, and we thought, well, we'd do that in a couple of hours, easy. Uh, and blundering through these uh, peat hussocks and bogs and everything else with 100 pounds on our back and everything else, uh, I thought, Jesus Christ, you know, what a desperate place. Yeah, I mean, you know, not the most welcome of places at all. Um, <laughs> you can say that. From, from, your, from your perspective, you know, you, what was your job when you got there? You, you mentioned about taking that particular yeah. area, but what else did you have to do? I mean, you, you have to set up camp. You have to, you know, you, you have to bed in for the night. Yeah. What, what, you know, what, what take us through that process? Uh, well, I was leading a, a, a company of, a, a rifle company of the battalion. So it's a, a, a hundred or so uh, souls. Um, uh, perhaps worth saying it was D Company. Uh, we were sort of known, as I explained in the book, uh, as Penal Company because D Company was always at the back of the queue for everything. Uh, we seemed to be the uh, the uh, parking lot for everyone else's bad lads, and you know, we were kind of I describe it as we were the the battalion's gulag, really. If uh, you had a bad lad, and you know, right, send him to D Company, and that was his last chance saloon, sort of thing. Uh, so that just quickly sort of sets the context there. Um, yes, once ashore, um, well, I mean, first of all, you hit the beach, as it were. It was an, un an unopposed landing, which was the way it was planned. Um, but, you know, there's always that element of uncertainty. Maybe there's an enemy patrol there or something like that. Uh, but fortunately, no opposition. Um, just confusion, really, because we should have been... Uh, uh, th th there was an SBS... Uh, patrol in the area and they were had been warned off to expect us um but when we eventually linked up with them we said, what are you doing here we didn't expect you for another two nights so you know this is war it, i mean it's you're always one step from chaos and confusion uh and then as i say our, our immediate task was to uh secure the um the southern perimeter of the beachhead uh from obviously counterattack by enemy land forces uh primarily, uh, but also uh, to provide some defence against the Argentinian Air Force, although that was really down to the uh, the, the ship's anti-aircraft uh, missiles and rapier. Um, but, you know, so we got on to Sussex Mountain. We should have been there by first light. As I said, it took twice as long as we expected. Uh, so it's getting on for sort of mid-morning by the time we were up there. Uh, absolutely knackered. The first thing you do is obviously... You, as, a, as an infantryman, you dig in, you go firm on the, the territory you've got to secure. So we started to dig in. Two inches down, we hit hit uh, hit water. I mean, we were just perched up there on a, on a peat bog. Uh, so uh, the answer then instead became a, a, a business of building up rather than digging in. Um, uh, and so the, there's probably still the remnants there today of the peat igloos that we built on top of Sussex Mountain and probably some archaeologists will uh, turn up in 100 years time and make an awful lot of these peat igloos in the, in the Falklands. I wonder, I, uh... <laughs> anyway, that, that was uh, the, the drill. Um, and then we sent out our own uh, uh, patrols forward of our position uh, just to make sure that, you know, uh, there were no enemy in the area and so on. Uh, so that's that was the basic drill. Um, and I think the trouble was that uh, then having done that, we were sort of sitting there in, in the most appalling uh, conditions, you know. Um, uh, and it's worth throwing in at this stage the state of our footwear, which was the old army DMS boot, which is made of uh, re reconstituted leather. Uh, and it leaked like a sieve. So from the moment we went ashore, really, I mean, you got wet feet uh, wading up the beach. Uh, but, uh, you know... Our feet were constantly sodden uh, because we just, con you know, walking around in this uh, this, this bog wherever you went. Um, uh, so uh, I think the concern was that we're sitting up there. The enemy were clearly nowhere in the area, at least their land forces. So there was no threat of a, of, of a ground counterattack. Uh, and we were beginning to twiddle our thumbs and think, you know, what are we doing here? What are we achieving? Very little. We wanted to, you know take the action to the enemy and then we had a, a bird's eye view uh, of you know uh, San Carlos water which was the the uh, the beachhead uh, where literally you know a ship a day was being sunk by the uh, Argentinian Air Force so 
um, you know, it wasn't a good few days. Um, uh, I mean, bad enough that I shared a, 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 one of these uh, Pete Diglu's with uh, my company runner, a chap called Wang Hanley. Wang uh, smoked like a chimney, and I, I'd, I'd uh, given up uh, smoking eight years ago before my first trip to the Himalayas, and uh, I think it was day two, I said, come on, Hanley, give me a cigarette. <laughs> <laughs> I started smoking it. It was that sort of desperate, really. Yeah. Um, uh, and um, yeah, uh, it wasn't really. I think it was about probably day three or so that you know the odd mutter of is this another Gallipoli were sort of going around the place. So not a good time. In all conflict, uh, morale is 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 what you know. I guess can you know make you you know feel ten foot tall or, or sink you and um, yeah, you've already absolutely. mentioned casualties on both sides there was the yeah. you know the sinking of the Belgrano yeah. there was the loss of all those lives on the HMS Sheffield what what you know what is it like for you as a serve uh, you know serving uh, for, with the Paras in that kind of situation when you hear that kind of news come through is it is it as severe as that or is it down to different people's mentality um well, it is severe, uh, and um, you know, obviously, uh, as a leader at any level, has that responsibility of, of keeping uh, morale up, uh, and so, uh, and that was difficult. Um, you know, the ordinary Toms were as able as I was to sort of see what was going on, and you know, ask the same questions. Um, and I think, again, here we were uh, fortunate that, uh, you know, H. Jones, our, our CEO, was, you know, a, a seriously uh, aggressive, uh, single-minded chap who uh, could see what's going on. So I think we all felt right, you know, yeah, this isn't good, but the, the chap at the top, H, is, is, is uh, uh, he's got the message. He need, knows we can't just sit here indefinitely and we need to get stuck in. Uh, and I think, so that provided us, provided us some breathing time for a little bit of hope that, you know, uh, we've got the right chap to get us moving rather than just sitting there like, you know, spare whatnots on, a, uh, on the backside of a camel. Um, but, yeah, you know, you have to address it. You have to make sure that, you know, this sort of demoralising period of inactivity didn't, didn't uh, start to undermine people's commitment. You've talked a lot about him already, Colonel H. Jones. Um, sounds like a right leader of men. Uh, he was. I mean, he was uh, He was a controversial character. Uh, I think there's no getting around that. Uh, but he was a, a highly um, motivated, aggressive uh, leader. Uh, uh, he... he uh, extremely impatient. If you didn't deliver, you soon knew about it. Uh, um, and I think I would say, um, in a way, he was a sort of old-fashioned sort of authoritarian type uh, type leader, uh, but um, and, and somewhat headstrong. Uh, but I do think that, uh, well, if we coming to Goose Green, I can't think of anyone uh, who would have uh, mounted that attack with the determination uh, that he did uh, with this battalion. Uh, in face of all this sort of uh, uh, kind of uh, um, perilous intelligence that we were getting just before the battle, which showed we were going up against, you know, uh, superior forces in, in, in almost every respect. Uh, and, uh, you know, with the very limited fire support. Uh, and, but H was the sort of guy who, you know, he was just so single-minded. Uh, and determined that we were going to win this battle. That uh, we we started Goose Green, I think, without any doubt in our minds that we were going to win. Uh, uh, and so, yes, we came across setbacks, and H himself eventually was killed. Uh, now that might have, you know, um, set us back on our heels and so on, but it didn't. We just had this absolute belief that we were going to prevail. Uh, and we could have, I think, taken 50% casualties, and we'd have still been pushing forward. And I, I put a lot of the credit for that mindset of the battalion uh, uh, down to H and his his leadership. Now, the flip side, he could be exasperating to work with. Um, uh, he you know, certainly didn't welcome discussion on his decisions and so on, which on occasions might have been uh, welcome, and talk about that in a bit, perhaps. But, um, but 
yeah, for all that, for all his faults, he got the big things right in my mind. So the, the Battle of Goose Green, I mean, I don't want to give you know too much away from the book, but this is a lot of the stuff that you've mentioned before in, in other interviews and you, you talked about it. And for those people who you know are maybe tuning in for the first time and you know are new to this, just, just tell us in, in essence what, what, what the Battle of Goose Green was, was about and, and why things led to that. Right. Well, uh, a number of people have even, uh, qu and still do question whether Goose Green needed to have been uh, fought at all. I mean, it was the nearest um, Argentinian garrison to the beachhead. Uh, it was an airfield. Um, they had had quite a lot of Picara ground attack aircraft based there, but they had all uh, flown off and then later destroyed by the SAS at, uh, uh, at uh, Pebble Island, or at least most of them. So the the air threat that it potentially posed wasn't that great. Uh, it had a, a sizable garrison, and in theory, I suppose, you know, with helicopter support, uh, that garrison could have been used to uh, mount a, a, a counterattack onto the beachhead. But it all seemed very uh, unlikely. And, and the view of Julian Thompson, the commander of 3 Commando Brigade, which we were part of, uh, was that, you know, there was no need to attack this uh, settlement. It could be masked off. Um, and I tend to agree with that assessment. Uh, the trouble was that um, it was taking a long time to build up. For, I mean, we all knew, and, and Thompson knew, that this, this war was going to be settled around the outskirts of, of Stanley, the capital of the Falkland Islands. Uh, and so, again, for that reason, Goose Green was a, a distraction, potentially. Um, but uh, there's a lot to be said for, you know, seizing the initiative and taking the uh, the uh, war to the enemy as soon as possible. That was certainly H's belief. Um, and I think the significant thing was that back home, uh, well, I, I think we were all, uh, back home and down there, we were all, uh, you know, getting incredibly exasperated with the lack of activity uh, and seeing, as I say, the, 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 the fleet losing a, a ship a day. And we just felt it couldn't go on like this. And I think eventually it got to the same point back home with the politicians uh, and, and um, the MOD defence staff in, in Whitehall that we had to be seen to be going onto the attack and, and notching up an early victory. And I think it's worth remembering at that stage also there was still huge pressure on uh, the Thatcher government from the Americans to negotiate a settlement. Uh, and I think, you know, frankly, uh, well, I think it would have been the end of the government that had, had, had uh, it ended up with negotiation instead of recovering the islands. So eventually this pressure was building from below on Thompson, I think, to let's get stuck in to something handy, close to, like Goose Green, uh, and also eventually from above, from uh, from Whitehall, you know, this building pressure, you know, you can't wait and deliberate uh, uh, and, and go for a steady build-up around Stanley. We need an early success. Uh, and so eventually Goose Green came up to the uh, top of the agenda. Uh, and I think, you know, yeah, that's... Uh, that's where it happened. Um, now, you know, we, we committed, but we were very under-resourced for, uh, well, we was, initially the idea was raid Goose Green, and eventually Whitehall said, no, no, raid is not enough, um, recover the settlements. Uh, again, I think that was a right call. If you raid, if a hit and run raid, which was being talked about, it, 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 it raises the question, you know, when do you stop hitting and, and turn around and start running? You know, at what point? Uh, you know, it, it's, it's a difficult, uh, sort of complex sort of situation. Uh, not only that, but, um, you know, had we co uh, undertaken a hit and run raid um, uh, and, and, you know, maybe caused some damage and then withdrawn, uh, well, you know, how do you think the Argentinians would play that? I think I, if I'd been an Argentinian, I'd claim, you know, first victory to... Um, uh, to the Argentinians, parachute, uh, parachute regiment attack repulsed. So you've got to sort of look at all this. And in the end, I think the, the right decision is partly driven by H, partly by Whitehall was, you know, go and recover these settlements. 
But we weren't really resourced for a, a, a major attack of that size. And I think it's partly because of logistics, um, uh, lack of helicopter resource to keep the guns supplied and so on. So we went in there with very little fire support for the for the mission that we had. I guess it makes the you know, the triumph overall even greater when you talk about finance because you think going into a, a war of any kind, you know, the one thing you need is the backing of your government, the backing financially. But it just sounds, and the more that I hear and read about this particular war, that we were, you know, we were we were scrimping and saving almost, make do and mend was the was what they used to say in the in the Second World War. And it feels <laughs> as if it feels as if the military had to do that. And if it hadn't been for the the courage of the men, but also the leadership of some of the others uh, involved, then you know it, it may have ended up quite differently. This, and it would have all been down to penny pinching. Well, yeah, I don't, I'm not sure I put it down to penny pinching as, as much as um, I don't think any army uh, or any commander has all the resources that he would uh, ideally like for uh, an operation. Uh, and I think that um, uh, there is always in all military operations a, a large degree of uh, make and mend of, of doing the best job you can with the resources you've got. You're never going to have a perfect situation. Uh, and that's, I think, the way I would look at it. But um, I think you you make another uh, very good point. You know, having made that commitment, you know, H, as I say, was very clear. There's got to be only one outcome, and that is an outright success. Uh, otherwise, it could be spun by the Ar Argentinians the other way around. Um, but um, I think that uh, having achieved that success, as you say, uh, you make the point, you know, that, that, that it was... Uh, a notable victory uh, and, and that is more than just sort of notable in material terms or gown, uh, uh, ground uh, gained and so on or, or you know part of their forces defeated it started i think uh, because it was such a uh, against the odds victory um it's i think it seriously started to undermine the um argentinians confidence and, and will to fight this war uh, uh, to, to uh, you know, un I mean, part of any military uh, objective has to be to undermine the military's will, uh, the enemy's will to fight. And I think Goose Green uh, started to uh, really uh, undermine their their whole commitment and confidence. Uh, and that, so I think, it was a, a very very important uh, outcome of the battle because I think it then set things up for uh, you know easier times. Uh, as we went further into the war. Uh, and I think that uh, I've heard it expressed by a number of people that, you know, we hoped we were going to win the war. We were pretty confident that we were going to win this war uh, once we secured the beachhead. But by God, once Goose Green had been won, we knew we were going to win this war. So I think it had a, a, a lot of important implications. You've already mentioned, um, you know, the you know the wonderful Lieutenant Colonel Jones, and and you know his bravery um, uh, eventually cost him his life on on this particular uh, this particular junta. Uh, yes, and I think again that's an important uh, um, uh, point because uh, it, it can have uh, when you lose uh, your CO. I mean, it can have. Uh, significant consequences and we, we all anyone who studied history will be aware of you know the the leader is is downed uh, and you know the army lose their will to fight uh, you go right back to the battle of hastings if you like you know harold gets his arrow in his eye and his army so uh, runs off um so um you know that is a potential implication um the other is, you know, the, the loss of uh, their, their leader so stirs up the, the troops that they, you know, go in for, you know, revenge and nothing will stop them. Um, and I think we were sort of, uh, uh, none of this really affected us. Um, I think the fact is that H was always uh, known as a leader from the front. Uh, there used to be sort of jokes in the battalion among the Toms of, you know, well, if he survives his first battle, you know, I'll eat my hat sort of thing. Uh, because he was just, you know, he was, uh, he, he led from the front, from the front uh, to, in a sense, to the point of rashness. So I think that when he was killed, you know, um, the Toms just took it in their stride, really, and said, well, 
we always reckoned that was there was a chance of that. Now we just got to get on and do it without him, uh, which we did. Um, and um, I mean, to say he was a, in some respects a, a very authoritarian uh, leader. Uh, I mean, I had my frustrations during the battle. I wanted to try and do a right flanking maneuver and sort of take the pressure off other people. And you know, he wouldn't. Uh, he wouldn't uh, unless he was there himself and see what was going on. He wouldn't allow it. I think he got himself far too immersed in in one of the other company's battles. Um, but, you know, people talk about leadership these days and they often say that, you know, what's the measure of a good leader? Uh, well, that his team go on to perform without him uh, uh, or in his absence. Uh, well, you know, that's exactly what we did when H was killed. We went on to complete the job uh, in spades without him. So, uh, you know, it's easy to be critical of H, but I think you've got to see him in the round uh, uh, and, uh, you know, see what he set us up to do. Uh, you know, the, the culture of the battalion that he was responsible for, its aggression and so on. It's not a black and white situation. Goose Green's often held as, uh, you know, it, it's held in high esteem, you know, because that was essentially what turned the war. I mean, in, in the week predecessor and uh, preceding, sorry, this this actual attack, the Argentines appeared to be on top that sunk four of, a, of our ships. Yeah. Um, yeah. And, you know, it, it looked as if they were digging in. But um, this particular win, it, it did seem to change things at home as well, because morale may affect the troops, but it affects the people back home as well. Yeah, no, exactly. I was saying earlier, you know, I mean, that, that was, uh, well, uh, undoubtedly uh, one of the concerns of, of the government back home and why they wanted this early uh, success on, on on land, because, you know, yeah, maintaining the morale of the population back home as well is, is uh, just as important in the long run as, as making sure that the morale on the ground uh, it, it holds. Eventually, we did manage to, you know, to, to win the islands back. T tell us about the, you know, the, the feeling that you had when when that announcement was made that um, the war was over. Um, well, I think, I mean, before the announcement, uh, certainly um, my company knew the war was over. We'd, we'd had this sort of uh, land share to do uh, the Battle of Wireless Ridge, which was, uh, the sort of really the sort of final gateway to entering into Stanley. Uh, uh, the other part of the gateway was tumble down, which was uh, being attacked by the Scots guards, and we'd driven them off Wireless Ridge. Uh, and then uh, eventually, uh, sometime later, really just about first light, uh, the Scots guards secured tumble down, and we saw hundreds of enemy pouring off uh, the farther, further end of Wireless Ridge and heading back towards uh, Stanley uh, and literally hundreds pouring off uh, down tum uh, from Tumbledown and, and again towards Stanley. And until then, we'd had a really, we'd secured the ridge and had a really unpleasant time. We were constantly uh, under constant uh, enemy artillery fire. Uh, every time we tried to engage uh, that invited another barrage of artillery fire and so on. Uh, and all of a sudden, as they, as they started pouring off uh, and, and we were, um, you know, trying to engage and so on, suddenly we were getting no answering fire back. And it was like uh, the, the the collapse of the Argentinian army was, it was almost as abrupt as, as, as flicking a light switch and turning a light off. It just suddenly all the opposition folded. And um, it was... Uh, so, I mean, from that moment, you know, in my mind, uh, I knew and I, all my chaps knew that it was over, that we'd won it. And I mean, you know, the surrender didn't, wasn't announced until, you know, probably about 12 hours after, but we already knew. Uh, and it was a moment of, of great elation um, uh, to sort of, you know, describe it as, um, well, the sort of, uh, when you're training, uh, the thing that everyone is looking uh, forward to is the uh, the order index, which means end of exercise. Great, you know, we can all start to relax and look forward to a nice uh, warm uh, warm bed back in barracks. Uh, so as we saw this collapse, literally, you know, within the sort of uh, first two hours of the day, the 14th of June, uh, these enemy fleeing off towards uh, Stanley, no answering fire coming back towards us and so on. Uh, you know, that was the cry, you know, 
Thompson. It's index. <laughs> and, you know, uh, so, you know, the helmets were removed. Um, red berries were picked out of, which had been hidden in pockets somewhere, were, you know, dug out and put on our heads and so on. So there was that sort of, uh, it was a splendid moment. I mean, uh, you know, we just, we'd had a bloody hard night. Uh, we'd had hard times before at Goose Green as well. And all of a sudden we knew we'd won uh, and we'd uh, we completed the job. Uh, and I think I felt we'd done it very well. So huge elation. Uh, but for me personally, also um, a, a huge uh, satisfaction uh, and, and pride in my men in, in what they've done. Nigel Lee said he had a couple of drinks, Philip. Did you? <laughs> uh, not until uh, that night in Stanley, where I think we, we we managed. Uh, I think my my company, Two IC and 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 uh, Color Sergeant, managed to uh, locate a store of Argentinian wine somewhere in Stanley, and uh, we were uh, billeted in in one of the houses uh, leading into the middle of Stanley, and suddenly appeared with this half a dozen bottles of wine, which we shared out among the company, and so I did have a drink or two. Yeah. <laughs> I think Nigel. I think Nigel had a few more than a fair. Yeah, yeah no, I agree with that. Yeah, no, 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 no Nigel. I, I, I'm sure he, he probably did. Yeah. Um, yeah. One thing I'd like to touch on is coming home. Uh, you know, it, it for me. You know, the the, the reception. I, I've watched the footage. I was alive. I mean, I was I was only what ten or eleven. You know, when yeah. the, when the war finished, and um, I remember those those celebrations and seeing people coming home. And you know, it's it's wonderful footage to watch back. How did it feel for you coming back? I mean, there never seems to be the you know the the, the right kind of reception for for serve uh, people who've served coming home and a hero's welcome. And and I, I guess from your perspective, you know, in in some way, it, it sometimes feels well. That's it. It's a job. It's over. On the next one. Yes, I mean it was in a way it was a bit uh, uh, anticlimactic. I mean, uh, you know, I I, I thrived uh, in the environment down there, uh, and then you know when it's all over, you know, kind of feeling a bit lost and and what next? Uh, and I think a, a lot of my soldiers uh, felt the same. In fact, quite a few. Uh, it, Be the arm to do, and I've done it. Let's let's move on and get another life. Um, uh, so you know there is that. Um, I think in the sort of detail. I mean, uh, one of the things that disappointed me was that we didn't go back uh, all the way to Portsmouth on the Norland, which was the North Sea ferry, which had taken us to war, uh, and we uh, we formed an incredible bond with that civilian crew of that ferry. And I think they're very much unsung heroes of the war. Uh, and uh, when we went ashore at, at San Carlos, I just uh, remember the sort of uh, the, the master of the Norland, a chap called Don Ellaby, getting up on the loudspeaker system. Uh, and he normally sort of plied passengers between uh, Hull and Zeebrugge. Uh, and he addressed us in, in that sort of spirit of sort of saying, well, you've been a lovely bunch of passengers. Um, I hope you have a good time ashore. Uh, and we uh, look forward to sending you home safely shortly. Well, you know, I mean, it was like that, you know, kind of absolutely got to me. Uh, and uh, so from that moment, Norland was the mothership for us. And, and I was, uh, I would have loved to have sailed all the way back to Portsmouth uh, on the Norland. Uh, but as it was, they, they took us as far as uh, Ascension Island. And we were then uh, flown home uh, to Bryce Norton from there because the Norland continued to do work down the South Atlantic for another three or four months. Um, and so we missed out on the sort of great flag waving arrival in Portsmouth and so on, which was a pity. I think uh, we got home a bit quicker, but I, 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 that, that wasn't the issue. I think, you know, taking a longer time to get home would have, you know, allowed for you know, what's now called decompression, um, uh, post-conflict decompression. So, um, uh, we missed out on that. I mean, yes, we had a, a good welcome at Bryce Norton. The Prince of Wales, who was our, our colonel in chief, uh, was there to greet us and so on. But it just wasn't quite the same as, you know, turning up as if we turned up at Portsmouth in the Northern.
we, you know, and hopefully we'd have still had the Prince of Wales to meet us there then, but you know what I mean. Uh, so, um, yeah, it was a bit anticlimactic. Um, uh, and then, you know, I was again sort of a bit dismayed by how quickly it, we reverted to, you know, things as they had been, you know, uh, the normal peacetime routine and admin, uh, you know, plotting career courses for your Toms and so on, all that sort of thing sort of began to uh, assume importance again. And from my personal point of view, uh, you know, I discovered... You know, D Company, I think, had had a bloody good war, but we got back to Aldershot and, you know, nothing had changed. We were still penal company. Uh, and, you know, I kind of thought this is unjust and I resented it. <laughs> yeah, I can, underst I can understand that. From, from your perspective, then, you know, you mentioned uh, earlier your passion for climbing. And I just, just want to ask you, you know, tell us uh, just a little bit about your expeditions to places such as the Himalayas and Mount Everest. Uh, right. Well, um, I, I, I've been twice to Everest. Once, the uh, first time was in 76. Uh, uh, and then I led a, um, a territorial army expedition in uh, 1992 to um, try and do a first British winter ascent. Now, that stage had only been climbed three times in winter by Koreans, Poles and, uh, and Japanese. So kind of that might give you a, a, a sort of hint of the sort of kamikaze nature of <laughs> climbing Everest in winter. Uh, and I, uh, sad to say, we didn't succeed, but we did get a British winter height record and we were the first winter expedition to bring everyone home. So I suppose it's a you know, small tick there. But um, I mean, two other expeditions really uh, stick in my mind. One was my very first one in 74. It's about the time that I left the uh, RAF regiment. Uh, and uh, did a, a first ascent of a mountain called Lamjung Himal in the Annapurna range. And I suppose nothing ever really quite competes with, you know, a first ascent, you know, where you really are going where no one else has put their feet or hands before. Uh, uh, and it was, a, 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 for me, I mean, it's my first Himalayan expedition, but also a first ascent. It was just uh, uh, amazing. Uh, and then my other sort of, main Himalayan venture was actually also uh, um, my honeymoon. Uh, and that was the, uh, we, uh, it was uh, the first expedition to China uh, since the 30s. Uh, and um, the guy who led the expedition had somehow wangled permission to get out there and climb this mountain. I told him I wasn't available. And then someone dropped out and he came knocking on my door again. And uh, he said, you know, can you make it? I said, well, only if I can bring my wife. Uh, because you know, you've got to think about these things, you know, wives and women on expeditions, if the rest are all male and haven't got their girlfriends with them, could be divisive. So he said, no, okay, you know, you can bring your wife. And so I then had a quick selling job and sort of saying, you know, what do we do? Do we go, you know, to Switzerland for two weeks? What about China for two months? That's a unique experience, Rachel, you know. Uh, and uh, so that was it. Yeah, we were there for two months um, uh, as my honeymoon. Uh, so yeah, it's open. My climbing has opened up all sorts of friendships, experiences, uh, 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 and um, yeah, it, it's been a constant in my life, really. Fantastic. You went on to set up um, a trust called the Ulysses Trust. Tell us yeah. about that. Yeah. Well, that was set up on the back of my uh, Everest in winter expedition. Uh, we were expecting to get commercial uh, sponsorship, uh, and in fact, we spoke to. Uh, we were engaged with two or three companies, uh, including News International. Um, but uh, the further they got into, you know, what was climbing uh, uh, Everest in winter all about, uh, the more they saw the chances of success were very slim. And, and they, I think they were sort of kind of a bit blanched by the idea it could turn into a disaster. So uh, all these commercial sponsorship negotiations eventually fizzled out. Although one or two did say, look, um, you know, we'd still be prepared to make a charitable contribution to this uh, project. Uh, is there a charity we could uh, donate to? And so we thought we better quickly form a charity uh, and take these uh, donations. So uh, that's what we did. Um, uh, and we called it the Ulysses Trust because Ulysses, a, a warrior adventurer, seemed appropriate. And I was a great fan of Tennyson's poem, Ulysses recommend it to everyone to go and read it. Uh, and um, so that was the start. And uh, I mean, primarily it was uh, created 
to fund this expedition. But we always said, look, you know, having set up this charity, we really should try to keep it going if we can, if we end up with a surplus. And as so often happens in, in these sort of enterprises, we did end up with a surplus. You know, we got at the very last minute a huge donation from one very uh, generous individual uh, that um, got us fully funded. All the fence scissors then got off, got off the fence and threw some more money into it. So we ended up with quite a, a reasonable surplus, which uh, enabled us to uh, then uh, make grants to uh, other reserve forces expeditions for the next couple of years. Uh, and then, you know, clearly the funds weren't, uh, wouldn't last forever. So it then moved into, you know, constantly uh, fundraising to keep that mission going. Uh, and two years after we first set it up as well, we broadened its remit. Uh, and, uh, and this is now our main remit to help fund um, uh, expeditions and adventurous training by members of the young cadet uh, forces. Uh, the air, air, air training corps, uh, uh, the the, the um, sea cadets, and so on. Fantastic. Uh, so we're still there doing that. We we uh, we uh, donate probably about two hundred and fifty thousand a year to you know, support anything up to sort of a thousand young individuals to go off on these on these adventures. Which I think you know, uh, I mean, I'm I'm still involved. It's I, in a sense, it's it's my baby, if you like, because I helped set it up. Uh, but also, you know, I, I do see the uh, the difference it makes to an awful lot of people, particularly, you know, young kids from disadvantaged backgrounds. So, yeah. Wonderful. Great stuff. Tell us, finally, uh, how the book came about. Uh, we've uh, talked a little bit about it today. <laughs> Penal Company on the Falklands. They say there's a book in everybody, Philip. Yeah. And there certainly was a book in you. Tell us a little bit about this. <laughs> well, uh, they, they, it had two sort of uh, uh, triggers, really. Um um, in um, in 2012, I was there helping with a, a film in the Falklands, and the the, uh, um, the producer uh, I got to know quite well over a period of sort of ten days. Um, you know, we did have a lot of conversations in the evenings, not just about the filming and the Falklands and so on. Um, so he learnt about my climbing and everything else, and he sort of said, "Phil, you know, you ought to write your book." Uh, about the Falklands and your climbing, you know, I see it now. He says the title, you know, from uh, from Everest to Goose Green and back, uh, and hmm, fair idea. Uh, and then later the same year, I was asked to do a presentation to the Royal Engineers Depot uh, at Chatham, uh, and um, unknown to me, the word had got out to a lot of my ex um, uh, Toms from D Company. Uh, and so as I got up to speak, you know, uh, a whole lot of hands have sort of, sort of started waving from the back of the room. God, bloody hell, you know, <laughs> it's half a dozen, about a dozen of my old NCOs and Toms. I thought, oh dear, I better tell the truth now. Uh, and uh, <laughs> anyway, uh, after the uh, the presentation, my, my company medic, a chap called Colin Delaney, uh, sort of handed me a beer and said, Phil, uh, because I, I started the story just outlining, you know, D Company and what it was like, and it was the Cinderella of, of, of two para. Um, but I never used the word penal. I didn't, you know, so, um, but it was definitely the Cinderella of two para. I put that across. Uh, so Colin came up to me afterwards with a beer and said, Phil, didn't you ever know we were known as Penal Company? And I said, no, but now it all makes sense. Uh, and actually, it's from that moment, uh, I, I really thought, you know, I've got, you know, the, the, the strand for a book now. Um, uh, I've got a potential title. Uh, and and more than that, I, I just thought, actually, you know, as we talked about the presentation over bit, I ought to sit down and write their story. And so, the, you know, that was my, my mission. That was 10 years ago. Uh, it took me, you know, nine years or so before I, uh, I started writing. I wrote about 3,000 words, and I thought, I just don't know how to... Is it is it really going to interest people? Can I write well enough? Um, uh, some of the what I wanted to get across was clearly sensitive. How do I do that and so on? You know, you can always find excuses for not progressing a book. Um, and then, you know, by good fortune, um, because of the uh, lockdown in in April twenty one, uh, I signed up for an online uh, memoir writing course uh, with a company called Curtis Brown. 
uh, who are a firm of literary agents, then you had to submit 3,000 words to um, uh, get selected for the course. And I think something like 60 people selected. Uh, it's a submitted applications and 15 were uh, selected for the course, one of whom was me. So that was uh, encouraging. And the, the, the tutor, the course, I found inspirational. Um, and uh, a woman called Kathy Rensenbrink, who'd written her own memoir. Uh, and um, in the course of this, uh, <laughs> this course, five-day course online, very intense, you know, I was discussing my, my difficulties and so on. And she just said, Phil, no one ever wrote a book. No author ever wrote a book sitting, waiting for inspiration. You've just got to start writing. Uh, and uh, that just gave me the sort of jolt I needed. And then the other course members, we all had to sort of critique each other's work uh, during the week. Uh, and, you know, to my surprise, the, the other members of the course seemed to really enjoy my 3,000 words uh, and said, you know, you've got to go ahead and, you know, we're, we're, we're behind you, we, you know, you've engaged us. Um, so I found that hugely encouraging. Uh, and really, uh, after that course, uh, uh, we were, you know, a year out from that was April 21, year out from the 40th anniversary. I thought the 40th anniversary was the obvious time to try and get this book published. Uh, so I started, you know, writing and I sort of pushed out 10,000 words a month for the next uh, seven months. <laughs> so. Well, it's a great job. The book is out there. Penal Company on the Falklands, a memoir of the Parachute Regiment at War 1982, uh, forward by Lieutenant General Sir Cedric Delves. It's available on Amazon. Get yourself on there. The link is in the bottom of the description. And uh, Philip Neem, absolute pleasure to speak to you. Uh, thank you for giving up an hour of your time to uh, come and share some of your stories with our podcast audience and uh, wish you all the best for the future. So thanks very much indeed for um, getting me onto this uh, podcast and I've very much enjoyed it. Thank, thank you. you. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.